Hey, Rich. How you doing? Good. Good to see you. So, Richard, I want to just dive into something because it's been on my mind. Okay. Where was Cedar Brook Park? Cedar Brook Park was directly behind my house on Kenyon Avenue in Plainfield, New Jersey. And there was a little bit of a woods between my backyard and the park. So it was like my backyard. I walked through the woods and there was the park. When I was coming up with songs for the new album, Nancy suggested I try to do something a la Penny Lane, Strawberry Fields, write about my hometown in a kind of nostalgic way. So I thought, okay, I'll write about Cedar Brook Park, the place I hung out every day. And the whole thing in that song about hearing the high school band was such a big part of my childhood. I'm sure you can relate to how exciting as a kid when you hear those parade drums doing those cadences, and I could hear them in my house and run out there and watch them. It's just such a thrill to hear those drums, that bass drum, boom, boom. Oh, I remember that very well. It, it's, it's not quite the same when you're listening to a, a rock and roll band as it is a marching band where you really feel that heavy vibration from, from yeah, the bass yeah. drum. And of course, it's being played with a mallet. Yeah. There's, there's nothing like it. But Cedar Brook Park is probably my favorite song from Copious Notes. Oh, cool. Your new album, you. which I've been really digging on. I don't know if you know the answer to this, because I know if people ask me, what, what's which, uh, what's the number in the succession of records you've released? What's the number on this? That is you know? my 14 full-length album. 14, okay. Yeah, it's hard to believe. So, when did uh, you do your first solo album? What year would that have been? 88, I did Living Room in a friend's living room, a four-track task cam recorder. Mm -hmm. And then I got a deal from that homemade record to be on Cypress A&M. They re-released Living Room. And then what happened was from that, I got signed to Sire. And yeah. then we did the second one, Hey Now. I had a band called The Rage in Washington, D.C. in the mid-70s. And that was the mm -hmm. first time I really you know, got out front as a guitar player. I had Tommy Keen, who went on to have a solo career. He was the other guitar player. Oh, is that right? Yeah, Nancy's brother, Ricky Street, played bass, and he went on to join the Sorrows, who were on CBS Records. So mm -hmm. that band was doing my original material, but I was simultaneously playing with Link Ray as a drummer. And so... Oh, wow. Yeah, so I divided attention there. And then I got offered to play in a band called Cooper Dodge on the West Coast. And it was steady money, and I really needed to start bringing in some kind of income. So I went out mm -hmm. to L.A. in the 70s, late 70s and spent most of the rest of the decade playing with the band Cooper Dodge as a drummer. And then I put out a single in 1980, which you'll appreciate with Dino Dinelli playing drums. Really? Yeah, I put out a single called Vacation, did that at House of Music out in New Jersey. I have that single. I think you gave me a copy. The first time I remember meeting you, I was with Mike Mazaris, and we were somewhere in Manhattan. At the time, we were playing with an, an old friend of yours, Mark Mazur. And the targets. I remember yeah, I that night very well because yeah. Yeah, Mark invited me out and I was really blown away by the band and playing. And you know what's interesting is that particular night, and I don't know what the evolution is, you were doing a very frenetic Keith Moon, Mitch Mitchell, very busy, which I love, kind of style. And then you changed after that subsequently for what I know of your drumming to more of a real Charlie Watts, Ringo backbeat style. But that night, I remember thinking, God, this guy's kind of like Keith Moon. Yeah. But that was a great night. Was that at Kenny's Castaways? Club 80? Oh, the 80s, I think it was called. Yeah, uh, yeah the 80s. It was uptown. I guess it was on yeah, like in the 80s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we ran into you on the street before the gig, and that's where you gave me that 45. Oh, cool. I have to dig that out. I forgot that Dino played on that. Yeah, he what? plays on both sides, and he was a real nice guy to work with. And stuck around to hear me do the rest of the session, all the vocals. He said he's a big fan of vocal harmonies. Is that right? He's a Beatle maniac, and he, he loves watching me layer my vocals, and so that was fun. Well, that's cool. I, you know, while we're on the subject of drummers... Mm. Before we get to talking about some of our favorite drummers, you started out as a drummer, as you said, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And you were quite young, right? Yeah, I, I was one of those guys that just instinctively knew I should be a drummer. I was a five-year-old kid and it just evolved into pestering my parents to get me a drum set. And finally, after a few snare drums and bongos, congas, things like that, they finally got me a trap set, as they could say. When I was mm -hmm. seven, Kent, 
one marine pearl four piece kit the rule of my life and I sat down and I just knew how to play just from watching drummers on TV I guess and probably from watching drummers and really studying records I'm sure at that point in your life you were already pretty off the deep end with listening to the radio and records right I, well, I really was so moved by early rock and roll because I had three older sisters and they had records around the house so I started to hear Chuck Berry James Brown Elvis of course I love that stuff and then there was that period from 60 to 64 which a lot of people assume was sort of this lower quality period in rock but for me it was so exciting I was right at that age where it was starting to hit you hard I used to love the Everly Brothers as a kid and whenever I would hear they're going to be on TV you know like I had solo God beyond I can't wait to watch those guys with the pompadours and that beautiful harmony so yeah it, it was a big big part of my life the early rock and roll and I just was lucky enough to be at the right age just becoming a teenager as the British invasion hit yeah I gotta say I agree with you that that early 60s period the so-called pre-Beatles era, I think it gets unfairly demoted. 1962, 63 yeah. are still two of my favorite years. Me too. And the quality of record making, the production. Yeah. Nancy works at home now, so every morning, for her to get her exercise, she does about 20 minutes to a half hour of dance. And she's a great 60s style dancer. So I get to DJ. Most of the stuff I play is from that period. Freddie Boom Boom Cannon and all that great 60s, 62, 63. Yeah. Think about Del Shannon, yeah. uh, Ron Hatt, The Beach Boys, The Four Seasons, Leslie yeah. Moore, The Drifters. That's what I played. Great songwriting that was happening. You know, what's funny is people think that the Beatles kind of invented the wheel, but to me, they were always just a continuation of that grill building style songwriting. Those minor mm -hmm. chords, those, you know, those nice chord progressions, Carol King style. They were just trying to perfect that and they brought a bunch of new things to the table, but it was just a kind of evolution. Was, I agree. It wasn't so much a revolution evolution is an evolution and they admit it they wanted to be Goffin and King so that was yeah. interesting to me that that period in retrospect got maligned as being this period where oh the story is Elvis went to the army you know the whole story Elvis went to the army Chuck Berry was in jail yeah. all this and, yeah. died. and it was all Bobby's teen idols but it was more than that like you a said, lot more Del Shannon alone yeah. As good a songwriter as anybody that ever lived. In. Roy Orbison was on the yeah. chart, the Surfaris, all kinds of great, great music. Jan and Dean. But I think why the Beatles, one of the reasons the Beatles are recognized as such game changers is because they really did reinforce, I think, the four man lineup as the focus for a musical act. So there were a lot of singers or maybe instrumental groups that had that, but it's hard for me to think offhand. Maybe you can think of some groups that were on the charts that were really... It's just the Beach you know, Boys. They were it. Yeah, that was the big thing for me with the Beatles. I saw them on the Jack Parr show for Ed Sullivan. You saw that, huh? And all I knew about the Beatles was songs I was starting to hear on the radio and that picture of them on the cover of the I Want to Hold, 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 hold Your Hand single. So when I saw them... I freaked out because they were a self-contained band with a drummer. And I thought they were going to be a vocal band like the Four Seasons. I really mm -hmm. did. I thought they were going to cut, have a couple guys standing there, maybe mm -hmm. one guy on guitar, maybe a guy with a stand-up bass or something. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what they were. And then all of a sudden, it's like the Ventures with great hair and, and the Beach Boy vocals. And it was like, well, too much for me. And you know, every yeah. brother's style harmonies, Ringo back there. <laughs> you know, and you mentioned the hair, right? That's the other thing that perhaps gets somewhat forgotten because it's such a, they changed the way young men wore their hair. Or back then we would say the way they combed their hair. Yeah. Remember? I mean, I remember yeah. hearing, oh, you got to see this group. They're from England. And I'm trying to think, well, what's England? I'm six years old. But I knew, okay, that's, you know, another country. And you should see the way they comb their hair. <laughs> and, and you know what, though? They changed that forever, of course, the way young men or men wear their hair. But if you weren't there, it's easy to dismiss what an earth-shattering change that was. It was faddish in a way, the way people looked at it, especially adults. Oh, look at these kids with the, the silly haircuts. That'll, that'll fade quickly. But it was so different. Their look was so different than the Beach Boys, the Four Seasons, or Dion and the Belmonts. It was really revolutionary. 
I think. You know, yeah, definitely. And I, fashion end of, end of things when they. I always wanted long hair for some reason. I, even as a kid, it was based more on like seeing Errol Flynn, and Robin Hood, and I used to have this book about Davy Crockett. There were drawings of Davy Crockett as like a teenager, and he had this real long shoulder length hair. So I always kind of dug that look. They came on the scene, it was like, oh, this is it. This is everything. Yeah. The music going and the look. Mm -hmm. And they're just obviously so charismatic. I mean, that was the thing. When President Kennedy was in office, it's the first time I think I and a lot of people realized what charisma is, you know, it's like this mm -hmm. likability. And when the Beatles showed up, now there it is again. That thing where you just want them to like you and you want to like them. And that's what that whole star power thing is that they had. Yeah. Plus it was geared for kids. So yeah. you could embrace that charisma and uh, in that way they became role models and then I think instilled that desire for anybody who wanted to become a musician or get into the arts to somehow evoke that kind of... I always felt they were so much better than they had to be. You know, <laughs> it was like even if they were half as good as that, they still would have been phenomenal. But they turned out to be such giants in writing and forming and playing and singing that it was like this extra added bonus that we all got. The Beatles were so special because of their totality, I think, the, the, those four spirits coming together. Yeah. And if you take one of the four away, one of those elements, it's just not the Beatles, you know. But we were talking about drummers and uh, you getting your drum kit. Can you remember some of your early drum heroes, if you had any, oh, sure. when you first started playing? Well, I got to start with Gene Krupa because my father had all the Benny Goodman albums that were available at that point. And so he was the guy. Then there was just the sound of the drums on a lot of hit records. Yeah. You know how Ringo talks about how because he's left-handed but plays right-handed, his fills are very kind of angular. They're not do 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 boom do do If you go back and listen to that same period we were just talking about, 61 to 63, a lot of drummers were doing that. I think that was part of the cool session drummer thing was knowing how to do those kind of fills. I mean, you listen to fills on something like Five O'Clock World. Or, mm. You know what I mean? Where it's very, I, I call them angular because mm -hmm. it's boom do 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 You know, it's weird. That makes a lot of those records special. I agree. You hit on something before where you mentioned Gene Krupp, but then you said, well, I got inspiration from records. And I think in a lot of cases for people of our general age who are aspiring musicians, it might be hard for us to even cite who our heroes were because they were session players and maybe yeah. in some cases rather obscure. No, I was just you thinking know? about how, you know, later on, everybody started talking about the West Coast guys, Hal Blaine and, and Earl Palmer. But the East Coast guys, Buddy Salzman and Gary Chester, and I was trying to Herman. find out who played on the twist. This guy wrote it to Ellis Tolan. Ellis Tolan. Just for that one performance alone, because that hi-hat, those eighth notes were crazy. Yeah. This is pre-Ringo. Yeah, everybody was like, oh, Ringo plays that open hi-hat. He didn't invent that. And that was part of a lot of early 60s records, even going back in the 50s. That sloshy hi-hat thing. Yeah, those yeah I, think, I think Earl Palmer was probably where he first heard it. Earl Palmer played like that quite a bit. The Long Tall Sally and you know, Little Richard records. You know. Gary Chester, I found out, played on Twist and Shout, which is one of my favorite right. records yeah. of all time. Yeah. A big part of that is his drum big part uh, yeah and i always say one of the most exciting moments in rock and roll for me are the last few bars of twist and shout where he suddenly opens up like his life depends on it and he's sloshing away on those symbols and it's so exciting it, it is gary chester played on so many wonderful records oh, wow. and you can really tell his feel if that's him on tell him by the exciters oh, you know? i love that song i love the exciters yeah and he would do that little kind of implied shuffle or that little roll thing that he, he does on that song i think i could pretty much recognize his style and he was on so many hits and i think in influential to a lot of kids our general age that were learning to play drums and you mentioned buddy saltzman Four Seasons records. Four Seasons, yeah. oh my God, yeah. And I think those are the feels and the fills on those records fall into the category like you were talking about Five O'Clock World. I don't, I'm not sure who plays on that. I actually referred to it once as pugilistic drumming. <laughs> <laughs> because it sounds like they're 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 hitting a punching bag, you know. Yeah, um, you can't get and that I sound. had the opportunity to meet Buddy and interview him oh, yeah? one time. Oh, cool. Yeah, people ask you who were your early influences, and he's way way up there. Sure. If only from the Four Seasons records alone. That when I was a kid, that and I gravitated towards the rhythm tracks. He was on quite a few of the records that really perked my ears to to want to play. Like if you listen to, to a record like Ronnie. 
by the Four Seasons mm -hmm. on the fade where he, he he does those real stuttery kind of fills. It just sounds like he's hitting like a punching <laughs> bag. Yeah. And I asked him, I, I said, what, what do you think informed that attitude playing drums? And he started talking about what it was like to be a session player in New York at the time. Gee whiz, they probably started eight, nine in the morning and went till eight, nine at night, right? And, yeah. and in New York with all the traffic and the energy of, of the city and stories he said, like getting his trap case lost in a taxi that sped away with his <laughs> trap case and oh my God. getting drums stolen. He says, I think what, to answer your question, I think what inspired that was madness <laughs> <laughs> well, you know it's you know? interesting you bring this up because i've been thinking about this lately it's, here we are two drummers talking so let's get into it what makes a drummer play a fill you know what is it that you're playing a backbeat and there's things that go on in your head that say i gotta play a fill right here and it's very instantaneous and it's about what you're hearing around you to me it's that's what it is it's like listening you're hearing something that's moving you emotionally and it's like, I got to put something extra here. I'm just hearing mm -hmm. it. I'm feeling it. Some of my favorite drum performances are where they get a little audacious. <laughs> and it's, I'm glad the producer didn't say, hey, yeah, you know, just keep it uh, two and four. Some of my all-time favorites are just these crazy. I mean, I'm twisting shout alone. Yeah. He's playing a gal gallop thing all through the song on almost every bar. It's like part yeah. of the, it's like a hook. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Charlie Watson, Get Off My Cloud. You know, it's like a thing, or Ruby Tuesday, yeah. same thing. It's like a little hook. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's too busy, and just lay down, you know, which I, you know, I get. But what is a fill, really? It's kind of like almost Latin percussion all of a sudden. You're hmm. playing a trap kit, but all of a sudden you're doing this thing, which is almost kind of congas, bongo, you know, you're trying to get that thing going within hmm. the beat. So all those things make a drum performance special to me. Now, that's not saying I don't love simplicity. I mean, Charlie Watts decided on satisfaction to not play one fill, mm -hmm. beginning to end, and it totally works. You know, where I, I would have never been able to have that control, but it worked. You know, uh -huh. you know Ringo sometimes, you'd be like, okay, he decided to keep it really simple on this one. But then you got Ray, where he goes nuts. And it, it is a little out of the ordinary for him. I think that's part of Ringo's charm and Charlie's charm and a lot of players that knew when not to play. It's all about being musical. The best players are all about supporting the song, supporting your other musicians. So you got to give them their space. But being a drummer, I know Hal Blaine always used to say, ah, all drummers are show-offs, right? <laughs> and he's probably right. But if you're a really good good drummer and you're musical yeah you want to show off but you wait for that just wait for that one little opening where it yeah. has meaning right. to put it there you and yet there's and, there are degrees of that because you got keith moon is the one side and mitch mitchell two of my favorites mm. Mm. constantly filling which i i don't mind it's it's working if it's working mm. it's working and then you got guys like bj wilson and purple harrow mm. love and bobby elliott who are a little more late you know laid back but still like you say a little show off for you at times and it's working. Mm -hmm. And then you, you got the guys that are what I call more meat and potatoes, like Charlie and Ringo. Back the, when they do stuff, it's like, wow, cool. But it all works. I love the whole gamut of really simple backbeat playing to total Keith Moon. You know, and then you got bottom. What is that about? Right. Yeah. But, you know, it's, again, it's, I think it's all about playing the song, supporting the song, and who you're playing with, too, you know? Yeah. Keith Moon didn't really sit in with other bands, did he, too much, <laughs> from what I understand. I mean, there's a few records like Bex Bolero, the Jeff Beck record, where he, he played on another artist's record, but he played like Keith Moon. Mm. But his style, I think, was so integrated into the ethos of what the Who created, you know, they... Yeah. I think Entwistle and Moon were the only two that could really get on the same plane with each other. Again, The Who, very much like The Beatles or many of the great bands, it was the sum of their parts and the way that they all came together, you know, yeah. that made them great. And yeah, you got Ringo. And, and I was going to interject that one of my favorite Ringo tracks is I'll Get You. Yeah. Which is hypnotic in its simplicity. Yeah, and the groove. Yeah. And, and the feel is almost otherworldly on that record. I agree, yeah. I'm hard-pressed to think of another record that has that insistence and that singular feel that he evoked on I'll Get You, the piece. Yeah, letters. there's just something about the timing of his right hand on, yeah. the, on the hi-hat that's just hypnotic. And when that single came out, I mean, I loved I Want to Hold Your Hand, but I thought it was kind of strange. I couldn't quite fathom what was going on there. It was a little too mm -hmm. sophisticated in a way for my 12-year-old ears. 
I liked it, but I was kind of like, wow, these guys are from England. I guess that's how they do it over there. But when I heard <laughs> she loves you, that was like, okay, this is moving my heart. This is Everly Brothers mixed with Goffin and King, chord changes. Yeah. And it was really getting that happy, sad thing that I love about rock and roll. Then I turned it over and I'll get you was the B-side. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, my God, I think I actually like this even better than <laughs> she loves you. Yeah. It's making me even more melancholy. And it almost sounds like beautiful. two different bands in a way. Yeah, well, that was the thing with the Beatles, how each release could have been a different group. That was new in a way because we were mm -hmm. used to, okay, here's the new Four Seasons song. It's definitely the Four Seasons. It's a great song, but it's them and the kind of, it's part two of the last one. You know, they're all yeah. Four Seasons epics. I love them. But the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, is nothing like She Loves You, which is nothing like Please Please Me, which is nothing like yeah. Love Me Do. They kind of hit us hard with those first five that we heard over here in the States. Did you ever hear or read that I Want to Hold Your Hand when they concocted that? They were writing specifically for the U.S. market in mind. They were trying to come up with something that would appeal to the u.s sensibility mm, that's how the story goes anyway, yeah. and it's interesting because you're right it doesn't sound like any single or any record they did prior to that or anything after it really you know i remember the first time i heard it it was New Year's Eve, 63, going into 64. It was on WABC, and they said, here's a group from England, the Beatles. And my first thought was, England? They don't have rock and roll. I thought that's where they go to Oxford and drink tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the song came on, and it wasn't what I was expecting. It was so incredibly different and powerful yeah. and raw. I mean, that's the thing that I can understand about why people kind of think that period was a lesser period, in that a lot of the singles were very orchestrated and sophisticated and arranged with horns and strings. The Beatles suddenly fit two guitars, bass, and drums. It had this rawness to it. So that was a big mm -hmm. part of the impact along with the hair. Yeah. Well, let me just ask you this. So first bands, you, you were in bands before the Beatles? Well, yeah, I, I had a band going with schoolmates, which was almost like Dixieland. Really? Yeah. We had and you're on drums? I'm playing drums. A couple trumpet players. You know, it was all you could do to find somebody that knew how to play like a guitar. We there was one kid in all of our circle of friends that played guitar, so we got him. And we were doing kind of like Dixieland, clarinet, trombone, that kind of thing. And it was that crossover period because I was at that age where the ventures were king. You had to know your ventures. You couldn't be in a band without playing the ventures stuff. Mm. Most bands were instrumental. And so when we first started, all that instrumental kind of surf rock and stuff, just dipped our toe into that. We got really into the R&B side of the British invasion, Kings, the Yardbirds, and the Animals were coming out. We got very kind of, as they say today, garagey. That was the Doughboys. That was the Doughboys, huh? Yeah, but Doughboys. It, it took the Beatles to flip the switch from Dixieland to rock and roll. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely want to be in one of those bands. Got together with my friend Mike Caruso, who played guitar. I was 12, and he was 13. That's how we started. We didn't even know what a bass was yet. So like we had three guitars going. And I had no idea. Somebody had to explain to me what a bass was. I didn't understand any of that. Yeah. And, and we were doing the ventures, instrumentals, and pipeline, things like that. And then one day, Caruso, the guitar player, shows up with a bass because he was doing the bass lines on guitar. Once you get the bass going, it sounds like the real thing now. And then you realize where you got to hit that bass drum. Finding that groove is kind of a learning experience. And hearing yeah. that bass as a 12-year-old would say, I get it. I see my bass mm -hmm. drum has to lock in with that. You know, a kind of a fun experimental trial and error learning period. Later, it's just see my kids were better right away. I was playing traditional grip, too. So I saw Ringo and Charlie. From the start? Oh, right, yeah. Start your oh, yeah. Always a traditional grip, yeah. And I continued. To this day? Do you to still play? Day, but I kind of flipped back and forth, you know, and that's all because of the English drummers that played match grip. But I was a big jazz aficionado. I was, you know, checking out Elton Jones, Buddy Rich, all those cats. So I, I stuck with my traditional grip. I could do certain things with that grip that I can't really do as well in match grip, for me anyway. It's a whole different feel playing trad, and I love yeah. it, you know. Yeah, and I do a lot of stuff with my thumb in there, you know, you get that going. So, you know, you're playing match grip, you can do it, but it's, and it, it looks cool. <laughs> it's yeah. Like, you know, like Dino Donnelly with the, with the traditional grip looks so cool. So I, I always kept both. 
Mm-hmm. But in the heat of battle, when you got to lay down that backbeat, I usually flip over to match go because it's just easier mm-hmm. on yeah. your hand. Yeah. You know, another player that I'm sure you admire as much as I do, kind of in the, the same mold as Gino, is Johnny Barbada from the Turtles. Oh, God, is he great. Yeah, fantastic. And both showmen. Yeah. Visual, visual showmen. And both guys that I think were coming from jazz, you know, from a love of jazz and probably some schooling in jazz, too. Yeah, and kind of, kind of that R&B-ish style, too. Playing in clubs and having to do those early kind of R&B things. Very snappy style. Yeah. I mean, talking about a great traditional grip, and I wish I knew his I knew his name at one point, but I can't remember. It's the drummer on the Tammy show with James Brown. He just is amazing on that performance. It, it wouldn't have been Clyde Stubblefield at that point, would it? It might be. You know, there's a number of James Brown drummers that played during the 60s with him. It might be him. Whoever's on that Tammy show, just rewatched it. I mean, because everybody's so focused on James, but the drummer is just laying it down like you would not believe. It's all mm. it's just everything you want out of the drum Forms. Yeah. Hey, so you're from Plainfield, New Jersey. That's correct. Not terribly far from where I grew up. It's probably about a half hour from Carteret. And I'm just wondering if, if there's anything that stands out in your memory about Plainfield or what you can tell us about how you think that informed your musical outlook. Obviously, you met your bandmates there, right? And Plainfield was a very cool place to grow up. And all the people from my era, at least, have this kind of rose-colored nostalgia for their childhood in Plainfield. It had some real luminaries, George Clinton from the Parliaments, mm. and they turned into Parliament Funkadelic. But originally, they were the Parliaments from Plainfield. Sure. And I got to see them back in the day. Did you? In the 60s. The Critters, who had a few hits, were a couple of guys were from Plainfield. The main guy, Don Sacconi, Zach Weed. They, so they were like a big, influential Plainfield band. And then there was another band called The Middle Class. These guys were a little older than the Doughboys, so they had more experience. And they had the whole kind of knowledge of being in a band that we were just learning. So that was part of growing up in Plainfield, having those bands around as iconic influences. Had a little bit of everything. Did you get to see all those bands? I know you said you saw the Parliaments. Oh, yeah, you I see? saw all of them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Would they yeah. play like your local, your dances at high school yeah, and they, stuff like they, that? They'd come in. I saw the Critters at a place called Shackamax and packed like sardines. And the thing that I remember about that was they were like an hour late for the performance, which at the time I thought was the coolest thing in the world. They were just running late, but I thought it's the arrogance of these guys. And then they kind of come in this back door behind the stage with their amps on their shoulders. And said, the whole thing about it was very cool. They set up and they opened up with Dancing in the Street. And this is how it's done. And my whole band was there. We were all like you know, standing like this. You know how bands are like, yeah, show us what you got. They blew us away. Yeah. Like I might add, the Smithereens blew me away. Oh, geez. Thank you. Like, people should know. We toured together and oh, let's see what these guys got. And the first night, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> like the real deal. So I saw all the bands, middle class with another one. They had a lead singer, Dave Palmer, who went on to be in Steely Dan. For Steely Dan, he said he's dirty work. Mm. So he fronted this band, Danny Mansolino, from North Plainfield on Hammond, Oregon. And that was exciting to hear Hammond, Oregon live back in the day. My biggest recommendation for you know, young musicians is never be in a band with a Hammond, Oregon. Yeah. You're going to end up being one of the guys who has to carry that thing up the staircase at some club, lift it up over a bar. Boy, they sound good. And the Leslie speaker. Yeah, I've heard this story from a lot of kids from back who were kids back then who played in bands that told me that they, yes, they actually, to every gig, they would schlep their B3 and their Leslie. And it's it's unthinkable now. <laughs> How many people would it take to carry a B3 up a flight of stairs? I would say four pretty strapping guys, you know, just about manage it. It's incredible. You know, two on each end. And I was one of them, and I was like 120 pounds. I can't drop this thing. And I did that for years. Played in a band called the Quinn Ames Band. It's like a piece of furniture. It's like an armoire. Yeah, it is, yeah. And the, uh, Leslie is, forget about it, it's a big, heavy speaker box. It's one thing to, to load it in, right? So you go through all that, you load it in, and you set it up, and you, <laughs> you do your show. But then you got to load it out after you're <laughs> tired. <laughs> I <you> know. know. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I know. That's just the way it was. How's your well, back, Richard? <laughs> the other thing I, I don't want to forget, can people still get your book, Boom Harang? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you go to my website. Okay. I guess that's the best way to get anything of mine, CDs, records, the book. It's all on the website. 
It's one of the best yeah. reads of, about rock and roll ever. I, oh, I, thank you. I, I, I wanted to read it again before we spoke, but I just poked through it a little bit. It's such a wonderful memoir, and it really captures that era and what it was like to be a teenager and a young person playing music and loving music in the 60s. It's just fabulous. And, Thank you. Uh, one of the stories that I always think about, and I'd love for you to talk about a little bit if you can, is when the Doughboys won, I guess you won a contest to make a couple singles for the Bell label. Yeah. And then you got to record a Bell sound in New York yeah, City. Yeah. We were on Zachary Lee's Disco Teen TV show, and we won a battle of the bands. This was 666. Can you just tell who Zachary Lee was for those who may not yeah, know? Zachary Lee was a very nice man who hosted a kind of like monster movie show in the New York area. I don't know if it was national, but definitely in the tri-state area. And he dressed up like a ghoul, kind of like Dracula. He was very funny and did these bits between the movies. And then he went on to host this rock and roll dance show, which was, I guess, loosely based on American Bandstand. Mm. He still wore the whole ghoul outfit, did a lot of comedy bits. And he'd have you know, some pretty well-known groups. He'd have the doors on. And a lot of big artists would come through. But also, every day, he would have bands from the area perform live. So the Doughboys were one of them. And we were called the Ascots at the time. And they had a year-long battle of the bands we won. And we changed our name to the Doughboys. And one of the prizes was a recording contract with Bell Records, which was a pretty big deal at the time. Bonafide label. Little Girl by Syndicate of Sound was on Bell for credit. Yeah. And so we were assigned a production team, Jerome Brothers, who had just produced Walk Away Renee and Pretty Ballerina. The left back so wow like, wow this is this is the real thing unfortunately i was 14 at the time i never thought about writing songs and nobody else in the band they were a year or two older and nobody was writing so we were just given these songs when we got the deal they said this is what you're going to record for the first single we we're doing this song wrote a mental bomb and it <laughs> was just the silly song that we did the best we could with we used to do these WMCA good guy shows every weekend in exchange for airplay. So it was a promotional show for the station, and we would play with everybody that was on the charts at the time, with the exclusion of the Beatles and Stones. But everybody else, Syndicate of Sound, Music Machine, all the girl group. I know our friend Mary Weiss hates that term, girl group. So the groups with women singers, I should say, whatever. You know, people should know Dennis and I played with Mary Weiss and Shangri Lines. So we get this deal, and we did two singles. And we played all these shows with all these luminaries, Neil Diamond, the Shirelles, everybody. It was amazing. It was a, these package shows where you'd go up, do three songs, and then go on and watch everybody else. Let me, let me interrupt. Did you get to interact with these people and, and speak yeah, with yeah. them? Yeah, we'd all be back in the so-called dressing rooms. They'd usually be at a, like a YMCA or a high school or gymnasium. And it was every Friday and Saturday for months on end. We did a lot of them. So for as long as we were trying to promote those singles, we would do these shows. And they were very exciting. Yeah, I remember one time standing out in the audience after our little set. And I'm watching, I think it was the Shirelles or something. And one of these really great, or the Chiffons or something the same. Nobody's going to believe this in the future. And I tell them about this because it's one after another. All the groups we were talking about, those early 60s groups that you and I loved, there they were up on stage doing, you know, their hit and a couple other things. It was just magical. So that was cool. And then we got to open up for the Beach Boys, which is a whole other thing. Yeah. The Doughboys used to do Bo Diddley. I'll just tell this briefly, but we opened up with the Beach Boys and we borrowed Dennis Wilson's floor tom for Bo Diddley because we used two floor toms and we forgot to bring one. And we were very garage and savage and we're going with maracas on the drums. Those early 60s floor toms, the screws on the floor tom legs were always loosened from the pressure. So we would drop to our knees and sit on the drums, pound them like in front of us. So we're finishing up the song Bo Diddley and out from the wings, Dennis Wilson charges onto the stage and jumps our lead singer and starts throwing punches at his head. And is swearing up a storm like a sour in front of the audience. And I'm like, it's shock. I tell us in the book, the main shock for me was I didn't know famous people knew the F word. And I just couldn't believe it. It was Dennis Wilson, he's gone, mother this, and I was like, oh. But he's also beating up our lead singer. Scavone was holding his own. The two of them were both pretty tough guys, but I think Scavone could have taken him. So he really had to. And they're mm -hmm. all, and, and Dennis is yelling, it's bands like you that ruined it for us. We kind of sell my trash at floor time, I understand, but it was in front of the audience. And it was too much for me. Heartbroken, because this was our big shot here, opening up for the Beach Boys. And this is when Good Vibrations was a hit. So a fan, and he's drawling on stage with our lead singer. And they had to be pried apart. <laughs> Jeez. 
we went home in a shock. We were like in a daze. But it made a great rock and roll story. Didn't you say in the book you later discovered he was not in a really good mood that day? Uh, yes, that was part of it. Carl Wilson was having some problem with the draft. And it was like, I guess, a big deal at the time. Mm -hmm. In the middle of that, on the date of this concert, which was at Symphony Hall in Newark, New Jersey. So they actually apologized and said, you're a little rough on that drum, but we overreacted. And I should mention the Buckinghams were also on the bill. They wouldn't let us use them for it. <laughs> you should have said to them, don't you care? <laughs> um, so can, can you just, I joke, folks. So, so when you went to, to the studio in New York City, Bell Sound was probably one of the best studios in, in Manhattan at the time. Yeah. And for a teenage group to go into those hallowed halls, I mean, was that your first time in a studio? Yeah, yeah, probably. So can only imagine, but you must have been stupefied, huh? Um, I think I was too young to be stupefied. <laughs> Yeah. It's just more exciting. I was a little actually bummed out because of the song, Rhoda Mendelbaum. I knew from the get-go, this is going to happen. This is too silly. And we were like a stonesy. We had some integrity for rowdy little kids. And we're doing this song, Rhoda Mendelbaum, which we did everything we could to make it sound like a garage rock song. But it really wasn't. That was that. And we uh, had to deal with that. And our second single was Everybody Knows My Name. Right. Hot Bob Gordio. Mm-hmm. Four Seasons, which was a much better song. I but just listened to it on YouTube today. It's great. I love yeah. it. And it's a pretty nice recording. I love the sound of the drums. I remember the Jerome brothers were really excited about the drums and bass sound that they were getting on that record. And if you listen to it today, it's very satisfying. You deep bottom. So I'm, pr I'm proud of that one. Did you ever hear it on the air? I never did, but people from around town would say, oh, I heard the record. So, you know, I was part of the deal. So I guess they, they lived up to their... I was an ABC guy, man. For that session, did you bring your own gear? No, that was the thing. There was a drum set there. Wow. And I assumed, and I guess I'm wrongly so, but I always assumed that the New York studios had house kits because that's how it was mm -hmm. for both singles. There was a drum set there. I don't remember which my own stuff at all. One of those worn out green pearl kits that was just ready to go. Didn't think twice about it. It was just there. So that was cool. And then I used to hear the stories about the West Coast guys all bringing their kits, the Cal Blaine. And I, thought, oh, I didn't know you had to bring your own set to studios. I thought there was always a house kit. But I guess even in New York, maybe that was an anomaly or something. Because like you said, there's stories of guys, I guess, bringing their trap case. Maybe there was like a kit, but you had to bring your trap case. Maybe. It was exciting. I, I wasn't intimidated. The Jerome brothers had just come off those big hit singles with the left back. So that was exciting to think, okay, these guys know what they're doing. I was surprised they brought a string section. I wrote a Mendel bomb you know, telling us I did the best we could. Mm -hmm. You know, I always kicked myself that I hadn't started trying to write some songs. So after you did those two singles, how much time went by before you went into the studio again? So that's 66, 67, and then 68, there's no real recording, but we were the house band at the Café Wa in Greenwich oh, Village wow. for the summer. For those who don't know, the Café Wa is on McDougal Street, and that's where Jimi Hendrix got his start. That was just two years before we were, he was there in 66. So that was a heady time. Then what happened was Doughboys after that split up. We just had had enough. We were living all in one room in the Albert Hotel where the Blues Magoos were staying. They had a room there too, so they were living there. And I tell a story in the book about how Pete Townsend came to visit the Blues Magoos and we got to sit and listen to Pete play acoustic guitar and singing songs from what was the Who's sell out. I got a call one day from Caruso, Mike Caruso from the Doughboys. We had split up and he asked me if I could play keyboards in this band called Cool Heat. And Cool Heat was like a session group that put out a single called Groovin' with Mr. Blow, and it became a big hit in England. And they needed a band to tour. So I got involved with that as a keyboard player. And I had never played keyboards in a band before. So I talk about that in the book. It's a funny story about how my very first gig with them, I was at an outdoor rock festival in 69 with this band called The Illusion. And they had the Hammond organ. And I had never sat behind a Hammond before. And I was scared to death because we only had one rehearsal before this festival. I barely knew the songs. And I touched the keys and it was so loud that it's like, <laughs> 
a shock and I'm trying to make it less volume. I'm fiddling with the pedal. There's a foot pedal. It's like you're in a truck. There's all kinds of levers and buttons and the foot pedal and everything I'm doing, nothing's changing. It's so loud and I have nobody to turn to. Everybody's preoccupied. And then the set's starting. I'm, oh my God, I barely know these songs and this thing. Every time you touch it, it is ear splittingly loud. And I somehow faked my way through that. I don't know how I did it, but I, I was right. clamming all over the place. And I was just looking out at the crowd thinking, well, what are these people thinking? <laughs> that was my brief encounter with the Howling B3. But uh, yeah, I was, so I was in this band, Cool Heat. I did a bunch of these things where I wasn't on the recording, but I was in the touring band. I got asked to play in a band called the Quinn Ames Band, who were on Electra, and they had an album out, and they broke up the day the album was released. There was no touring right. band. And they wouldn't, not one of them would go on the promotional tour, which was opening for Sly and the Family Stone, who were huge at the wow. time. It was in the early 70s. And so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. So back on drums. Thank God. Our first gig after one rehearsal was opening for Sly and the Family Stone at Madison Square Garden. Sold out performance. Talk about nervous. That was probably the most scared I've ever been walking onto a stage. I had to go up these flight, little flight of stairs up to the stage, and I, my knees literally buckled because we weren't ready. We had one quick rehearsal. We learned one song from the record we were supposed to be promoting. <laughs> and nobody in the band was from the group that recorded this. Yeah. And so we became the Quinn Ames band from then on for several years. These things that would happen, yeah. And then, you know, we went around and toured. It was fun, though. I mean, we got some good response from the audience. I don't know, Richard, we could probably... Well, we should do this again sometime. I mean, we're, oh, I, we're know. Just... I, I mean, I knew we would go off into tangents, but who knew? I mean, yeah, yeah. this is like a lifetime of, of music for the two of us. And I, mean, I could turn it around and start interviewing you very easily. <laughs> I have a million questions. Well, we yeah, both have a lot of passion for music, that's for sure, you know. And uh, Being someone who's played guitar and keyboards in different bands and bass, there's nothing like being on the drummer's stool. It's the greatest place to be on stage. It sounds the best there. It's just you're totally responsible for the energy that night. Mm -hmm. I think a big part of the payback is I think when you're doing good work and it connects with the audience, you're making them happy and maybe just bringing them to a, a place they wouldn't otherwise be able to go to emotionally or spiritually. You know, yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for that. And I think that's why music is so important to people. The drummer's credo from some great drummer was don't lose the dance floor. Mm. Don't lose the dance floor. Yeah. And it's really the best advice Lay down that groove. Yeah. And like you said earlier, support the song. Yeah, and if the song is making you go crazy and want to do a little more fill-in than you ought to, go for it. Well, like you they, said before, some of those drum parts really become hooks, and w a well-placed one could really uh, yeah. perk up the listener and, and spin some heads, you know? And that's yeah, well, the, the case in point of those first two Hendrix albums. Yeah. Rich Mitchell is going head to head with Jimmy on guitar. I mean, he's keeping right up with them. You just did that. Listen to this. And, and they're supporting each other, though. Mm -hmm. And so now it's working. And he's doing crazy Elvin Jones jazz riffs and overplaying like crazy, but it's still working. So I know that's real magic when you could play all that much and find a way to make it all cohesive. Because those records are very exciting. And they, don't feel, they don't feel cluttered. Yeah. They just, everything's in its place. But just to pay a compliment to you on A Girl Like You, I took note of how you didn't play fills where you could have, and it's working. That just drive and beat. It's like, yeah, go for that. Mm -hmm. And on yeah. Girl Like You, I noticed, you know, you just laid it down. And I really appreciated that because it worked. Well, it works too because the riff is insistent on that tune as well. So you got to keep in mind with everything else that's going on. And if it tied yeah. together, that, that's what makes it well, you know? Yeah, kudos on that. I mean, it's like a good choice that was made that, made that record one of the ingredients that made it a hit. Thanks. I don't want to forget mm. to remind anybody that's watching that Richard does have a new album. That's right. Copious Notes. We didn't get to talk about it too much. I knew, I knew we were here for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. Thanks. There's several songs that I put in heavy rotation in my, my own playlist right now. Another one I really like is But Our Love. Oh, thank Another you. Yeah, that. that's a ballad. I was kind of going for a little Everly Brothers, kind of big power ballad-y thing. This record started out as piano instrumentals. And I was coming off of my last album, Pop Circles. 
kind of lost it for a while. I didn't really want to do any more writing or music. And I just laid low, totally lost interest in doing anything. And then the pandemic hit and it took months before I started to just sit down at the piano. I wrote a bunch of instrumentals and every now and then Nancy would hear one she liked and she said, oh, you should demo that. So that's what became the album, those instrumentals. And I picked from those which ones would lend themselves to a vocal overlay and, and lyrics. So for instance, Cedarbrook Park that you mentioned before was just a waltz, a piano waltz. And then I had another one in a different key. I needed a second part for Cedar Park. So I said, well, maybe I'll just combine those two, change the key of the other one. And then Nancy suggested, write about your hometown. So that became a song. A couple songs, I thought, you know, we should do some horns, something different. So Nancy said, you know, I went to college with Proven Gregory, who plays with Brian Wilson. Oh, you know? and he's Nancy in, went to college with him? Yeah, Oberlin College with Proben. So she said, let's ask Proben if he'll play brass. So he played a bunch of trumpet and trombone, flugelhorn and stuff. And great. And then we discovered we have a guy, Duke Guillaume. He's a jazz saxophonist. I said, let's get him to do the woodwind stuff against Proben's brass stuff. So we had a, a section. And then Proben recommended this woman, Caitlin Wolfberg, plays violin and viola out on the West Coast. And Proben is is a, a fantastic. Yeah. I've worked with Proben too, and he's just uh, yeah, he's fantastic. And I'm such a stickler, if possible. I mean, you do this in our bedroom, except for the drums. I want to just put a plug in for East Side Sound. Oh, is that where you did the drums? Yeah, where we, you and I did some work together. That's in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. That's where I always do my drum tracks. It's just an empty room. I put the drums right in the middle of the studio. And Lou Holzman, who's a drummer and the, and the owner of the studio, happens right. to have a collection of vintage drums. And he has this real nice collection of Rogers drums. And I've become kind mm. of a Rogers aficionado. I love Rogers. Yeah, I have a Ludwig kit. And I, for a while, I had slung on them. But this Rogers kit that I have that I use for the Doughboys just has this resonance that I love. And he has some vintage 60s Rogers stuff. So I use that kit. Drums all mic'd up in the middle of an empty room and me just banging away for 10, 12 hours. <laughs> I bring all those home and then we start overdubbing the parts. But everything, strings, horns, all real players, all human beings. It's so nice now how you can send out stuff to people. They send it back to you via the internet. Whole new world. And Nancy plays on the record too. Oh right? yeah, I should mention Nancy's just the most fabulous bass player. She plays a Hofner club bass, which is like a single cutaway version of the violin bass. Oh. It's got a real nice rounded sound. And she plays with a pick, so we get a nice cool recording sound. And we've been both listening to a lot of Motown and just studying James Jamerson, figuring out what is it that he's doing that we can incorporate and emulate. And it's a lot of syncopation and chromatic eighth notes that he puts in that we've put in. It's sneaky. You know, you got to listen for it, but we do a lot of homage to that style. Brian Wilson used to talk about how he was just so in awe of Phil Spector's production. And he says, the whole thing is listening. He says, if you just listen, you can learn. I took that to heart. And I really do listen to other productions. And like, I don't know if you'll know, on this particular album and the last two albums, I made a decision that I wasn't going to play any crash cymbals oh. to open up that frequency for mm -hmm. guitars, vocals, and things. I listened to Beach Boys productions, Phil Spector, and there's like very little cymbals at all. Yeah. I thought, I'm going to try that. I've done the splashy cymbal thing forever. I'm going to try toning it back so that when you turn the music loud, there's no harsh cymbal crash frequencies that be owned by the guitars or the keyboards. Yeah. So that was kind of an experimental thing that I decided to do from listening to other people's productions. And, I, and I'm yeah. happy I did it because the energy may be a little less, but you can blast this thing up. And the louder you play copious notes, the better it's going to sound. I'm starting my next album and I'm going back, rocking out, and it's all crazy splashy cymbals. You have cymbals on the new recording? Yeah, yeah, I'm going nuts now. Because what it is, when I did all the tracks for this album, the drum tracks, I also recorded all these songs I had written for the Doughboys that they recorded. I was one of the writers of the band. All those Doughboy songs were my songs that I thought, ah, you know, I wrote them. I should give it a shot. Let me see what I can come up with. So they're all going to be on the next album. They started out trying to be garage type songs, but when I do them, they, they get a little more poppy. And so we'll see what happens. We've just completed the first song and it's a whole other type of production. Uh -huh. Much more raucous, a lot of cymbal work. Cool. Looking forward to that. Wish you a lot of luck with copious notes. And, Thank uh, you, Dennis. You can get that on your website. You can get that on Amazon, I guess, or yeah, wherever, wherever fine products are sold. 
And my website, of course, is always the easiest. It's just all there, as well as all the, all the past catalog and the book. Have you been to any record stores in the last year or two? I haven't, no. I haven't been anywhere, really. So, What's around in Manhattan at this time? Frankly, I don't know. I haven't been going out anywhere. Just dipping our toe into going out to restaurants again for the first time. Mm-hmm. I imagine Rough Trade is still there in Brooklyn. and uh, Yeah, I don't know, unfortunately, but uh, I hope so. Good thing is we all have our music to enjoy. It's a godsend. It really is. It is. It's another testament to why music is so important and why we do this. Yeah, it's all about feelings for me. It's what got me involved in music in the first place. It just makes me feel so good to hear it. I still, to this day, get chills. You know, when I'm doing the dance party with Nancy and I put on Gary U.S. Bonds doing quarter to three or down in New Orleans. It's like, oh, I get the chills. I mean, I get the chills from Neil Sedaka. I mean, I love everything. I do too. You know, I hope people don't take offense at this, but I remember when the band Nirvana was the rage. Oh, I, yeah, I appreciate it. But I used to tell people at the time, yeah, I, I get Nirvana, but to me, Neil Sedaka is more important. <laughs> What's your favorite Neil Sedaka single? Do you have one? Oh, my God. They're all good. I mean, every one. I Happy mean, birthday, Sweet 16. Happy, sir, yeah, and I love Calendar Girl. Yeah. That's another one with some blop, blop, blop drum fills that go on throughout the whole song. I wonder if that's Buddy Salzman. I'm, it's I'm, Panama Francis. Oh, okay. And the reason I know that, and I think you can find this on YouTube, somebody leaked out some sessions, some Neil Sedaka sessions. Oh, wow. And I think you'd find them fascinating. There's the session for oh. Calendar Girl. Oh, my God. And it goes on for like 25 minutes or whatever. And they do all the run-throughs and it's in pristine stereo. Oh, cool. Ah. On the early takes, they don't have that press roll thing happening yet. I think they were using a timpani in that spot. Oh, yeah. But it's great. You hear all the musicians. You hear breakdowns on the takes. and. Um, oh, wow. I got to check that out. Yeah. One of my favorite rock and roll experiences is just listening to Louie Louie. Mm-hmm. To imagine being there the gods of rock and roll shining down on them. Everything is just going in the right direction. Drummer is possessed. I mean, it's the most savage, ridiculous drum performance. And I love when the guy comes in after the solo too early. Yeah, early. And the drummer says, this is a prime example of when do I play a fill? The drummer does this amazing fill to like almost say, let's get on with it. Let's go. They could have stopped. I had such a gas talking to you. I mean, just the yeah. tip of the iceberg, as they say. It really is. I want to ask you so many more things, but we'll do it again. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And, and such a joy sharing your passion. We're both lifers. Yeah, that's you know, a good we, way to put it. Yeah. We started young and not giving up. I think we still have the same passion for the records. I think that when we were kids, the way they got to us then still get to us now, like you were saying, when you play Gary U.S. Bonds or whoever it might be. The magic is still there on the records and still speaks to us. I know. It's like I listen to those early 60s records, and I always say to Nancy, you couldn't get a record to sound like that today if you tried. Just wouldn't Mm. be able to do it. Can't replicate Mm. that. The equipment, the tie, I don't know what it is. The sound of the drums, where they're sitting in the mix, just different than it is now. Well, there's a lot of factors. It's the gear. It's the people playing. They were bred from a different generation of learning. Those guys were coming from the big band era. They were coming from a whole different schooling and and train of thought. It goes back to, you might have heard this. There was a group at a session in a studio, and they said to the producer, we want to get that John Bonham sound on the drums. And the producer says, okay, first get John Bonham. (laughs) It's the player. It's like the guitar, too. It's the the guy's fingers. Everybody's so concerned about the gear and the boxes they use. It's all in here. Yeah, that reminds me of another story you might have heard. Chet Atkins is in the studio, right? And he's playing. And somebody says, man, I'll tell you what, Chet, that guitar you got there, that's a great sounding guitar. He says, oh, you think so, huh? So he takes the guitar off and he puts it on the stand. He says, how does it sound now? (laughs) That's it. Yeah, that's so true. It's I listened to a lot of Sinatra, and when the drummer would lay into a snare riff, it's like the perfect sound, and you wonder, what snare is that? Where's the mic? And why does it sound so incredible? And I often say to Nancy, I wonder where that snare drum is today. Does it still exist? Mm. There's somebody on some YouTube thing I saw talking about how they have the symbol that Joe Morella used on Take 5. Oh, wow. Yeah, what a thing to have. And I think there's maybe a similar story about the hi-hats from I think the twist. Really? There's times where I like think about where are those instruments today?
There is a museum in Nashville that has some of that stuff, you know. Oh, yeah? They have one of Hal Blaine's kits, and they have, I can't even tell you, but they have, I think it's called Musicians Hall of Fame. Huh. So there are some of those there. That's nice to know. You know, it's so sad how kind of like connoisseurs of this session drummer thing, but so many names are lost. You don't know for sure who played on what. Yeah. To the East Coast guys. And what a legacy. Yeah, I guess if for some reason on the West Coast, the AFM contracts for a lot of sessions survive, but not on the East Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why. Let's not even get started with Detroit yeah. and Benjamin. And, and Marvin Gaye played on some stuff. Yeah, I think Marvin Gaye played on like, Do You Love Me? And Please, Mr. Postman, I think. There was always the story that he played on fingertips. But I don't know if that's true because I saw a video that sounds like it's the actual record. It's interesting how YouTube has so many visual images of early music that you can start to either reinforce or dispel certain rumors or you know, stories, tall tales about things. One quick story I'll tell you that I did a little detective work on is the Who at Monterey. We all know Keith at one point takes a snare drum and I guess it's in the middle of substitute, I think, and just picks it up and throws it off to the side. And at first, I used to just think it was just some crazy Keith Moon thing. But then under close inspection, I realized he split the head as he picks it up. You can see it. So I realized, okay, that's what Keith Moon would do. He doesn't leave it there. He just gets it out of his way. So that's cool. But then they start the next song. I think it was either Summertime Blues or whatever they did after substitute. And I realized he doesn't have the snare. He's playing the whole next song without the snare drum. Is that right? And he doesn't care. <laughs> and then somebody, I guess, was frantically fixing that or gave him another snare because by the third song, there's a snare back in place. That's crazy. I'll have to look for that. Next time we'll have to talk about you seeing the Who at oh, the high school, was it? Union Catholic High School. Yeah. We well, also have our shared memory of playing with the great Mary Weiss. And oh, good. yeah. That was wild. You've had this experience probably more than I have, but there's nothing that can top playing the song that was a hit song on the radio, especially one that yes. Biggie when you were growing up. Mm -hmm. So when we were playing those songs with Mary, what a thrill. I got to play with Link Ray and I'm playing Lumble. And I was like, oh. I was going to ask you about Link. We'll have to do this again, for sure. There's too much to talk about. I, know. I can't believe it. I, I need to tell you the time that I hung out with Bobby Graham. Oh, wow. Don't forget, copious notes. I recommend it. Oh, good. You can't get any better than that. Ah, Richard, it's a pleasure. Same here. Keep on rocking. So that's all we know how to do. Bye.